I think we can go ahead and get started. And I, we are live right now. Um, welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our second round of workshops for the day. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, the morning sessions and um, the live brain breaks. Those are really fun. I encourage you to do that. Um, so just so you know, you're at the right place. Um, this is the workshop for Healthy Futures an Alternative to Suspension Curriculum. Um, first, I wanna go over some quick reminders. Uh, just a reminder that these sessions are being recorded and they'll be made available to you next week. Also, all the slides will be made available to you. And um, also feel free to use the chat, the Q&A um, section if you wanna throw in a, a question for the presenters. Um, and also don't forget, we'll be collecting evaluations at the end of the day and you should be getting a link to that as well. And so I will just go ahead and hand it over to our presenters. We have our wonderful presenters from Stanford University School of Medicine, Division of Adolescent Medicine. We have Marsha Zaria, and, uh, who is a public health specialist and director of positive youth development, and Richard Ceballos, who's a project co-director of Tobacco Prevention Toolkit and Cannabis Awareness and Prevention Toolkit. Um, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to our, our workshop. Um, what we're gonna be covering today is a little bit about what's going on with e-cigarette usage. Uh, we're gonna do an overview of healthy futures and then a quick evaluation and a wrap up. So what you're seeing represents the current data that we have right now from the Monitoring the Futures um, survey, which is an annual survey, which is nationwide and represents eighth, 10th, and 12th graders. And what it does is it discusses what is um, their um, alcohol, drug, and other drug use, and also their attitudes towards that. If you take a look at the, at the image on the left, you'll see kind of like a snapshot of what daily nicotine vaping looks like for eighth, 10th, and 12th graders, which was first measured in 2019. And over to the right, you'll see a graph illustrating what's been going on for the last two years. And if you'll notice, there is, um, in terms of usage, the percentages have doubled in the, the past two years. So vaping has really taken off, as, as we all know. In terms of what youth are using, cigarette usage has dropped a lot. And, and in place, we have more students vaping nicotine products. And over the last 10 years or so, you'll see that cigarette smoking has really declined sharply. Uh, in terms of why um, teens are you know, vaping more, um, there's two, um, two things that I wanted to um, bring up. Uh, one has to do with why they're doing, um, why they're vaping. So one has to do with, with them wanting to relax or relax or um, relieve tension. And then the other one was about the fact that they're hooked. And those two are very significant from, from last year's um, report. But the other thing that I wanted to also bring up was the fact that now during um, sheltering in place that a lot of our young people are, ex are experiencing um, greater stress and, and it, it, it just speaks to what we um, can only um, predict for what was gonna, what's gonna happen next year when this survey is done again. So we have a, a lot of young people that are under a lot of tension and a lot of young people that are, that are um, hooked on vapes. So in terms of what's going on in the news, um, about a year ago, we started hearing about um, Evilly or these um, serious lung injuries that were happening for people that were vaping. And there were several, several deaths. Um, the youngest one was um, a 15 year old. In terms of um, the patients that were, were ill with um, this, um, this illness, over 50% were um, teenagers and young adults. And one of the things that I really wanted to point out has to do with um, informal products that they were using, especially the younger folks. Um, and it's something for us to educate our young people that a lot of the products that they were using were from informal sources, meaning that they were using um, products from family and friends, or they were getting them online, or they were um, purchasing them through social media. So just uh, making our young people aware of, of um, counterfeit 
um, counterfeit products and that these products um, are very harmful to their health. So we would like to present um, a short video uh, which um, illustrates the benefits of going smoke-free or vape-free. <laughs> So I um, wanted just to point out that a lot of the information that you're getting is available for free and online um, on our toolkit and the address is located right there and um, we'll be, make sure that we put it in the, in the uh, chat box. Um, so there's, um, we have a lot of um, COVID-19 resources that you could give to your students or to give to um, families as well. Uh, so. Before we jump into the curriculum, I just want to um, present um, and acknowledge our amazing dream team, wonderful people, colleagues that um, are working really hard on, on various um, forms of our project. And I also like to acknowledge um, our Youth Action Board um, to a group of 20 young people from the San Francisco Bay Area. We have two people from North Carolina and Maryland. They've done a variety of things from webinars to creating content for our curriculum and also um, our social media. And we also would like to thank our many sponsors and funders. So when you get to our website and you look up Healthy Futures, you'll be seeing kind of this page. So I just wanted to give you a little information about what that looks like. The, um, let me just go back, I'm sorry. So the, uh, we have a one hour and a two hour and a four hour. I just wanted to differentiate between all of those. Uh, the one hour is um, for one-to-one -one, and then the two to four hour, that would be for like a small group setting with a, a provider facilitator with, um, with a group. And so the reason um, for us to come up with um, this um, particular curriculum is that there was a huge need for um, schools to help students that were caught vaping and especially um, not to punish them for vaping but to provide them with resources and ways to help them to quit in a very supportive environment and not to have any type of confrontation with them but to really to have a, con a conversation about their vape use, um, having a very empathetic environment and and figuring out like what their what their future plans were in terms of um, changing their habits and then providing them with um, resources so that they can um, quit vaping. So when you look at the different curricula, they're basically the same. The, um, the difference between the one and the two and four hour ones is um, the discussion piece because that's like in a, in a group setting. Uh, we're gonna be kind of doing a little bit of the curricula that would be the most um, kind of like the most useful, I believe, in a, especially in a school-based health center, um, especially working with um, kind of one-to-one -one with, um, with students. But, it, you know, again, some clinics do work um, in group settings as well. So what um, we're going to show you is um, we're going to show you a couple of the worksheets, uh, which is uh, the where, you, where Are You At worksheets, and then there's a Healthy Features Handbook that um, includes a motivational interviewing and decisional balance um, integrated in the handbook. And then we're gonna have some informational slides for you. So when you look at the very first um, 
you should be getting the link um, in the uh, in the chat. Uh, so kind of like when you look at the very first one, it has to do with um, where is the youth at when it comes to vaping. And so it's um, geared to really understanding where they are at right now, what are the products that they're using, and then how often they're using. And then at the bottom, there's a kind of like a little ruler that kind of like tells will tell us uh, the provider where they're at when it comes to smoking and their readiness to make any kind of change. And so we would um, want to know um, uh, why would they why did they pick that number? Uh, oops, I'm moving. Sorry about that. Give me one. Give me a second. Tell me, um, tell me a little bit more why you, you picked that particular number where you're at, um, and why didn't you pick a lower number? And what will it take you to go um, two to three steps higher, or two to three numbers higher? And then before getting onto the curriculum is to thank them and if they have any questions before continuing with the, um, with the session. So I could imagine that perhaps maybe if this was to be broken up in terms of people um, implementing this curriculum, it could be a health educator or it could be part of it, could be done by maybe a medical assistant and then the rest would be done by a health educator or a therapist or um, a nurse. So there's a, you know, it all depends on your, um, your particular setup at your um, clinic. And now for this part, Richard will be talking over, talking about the Healthy Futures Handbook and going over the informational slides. Hi, everybody. We will be including some links to these downloads for the worksheet that you just saw on the previous slide, along with a downloadable link for the Healthy Futures Handbook. Now, I know we are not currently seeing students in person, but the Healthy Futures Handbook is great for asking questions and motivating students around their quit plan. So uh, you'll notice that the Healthy Futures Handbook is organized by topics in the actual Healthy Futures curriculum. On the next slide, Marsha, if you mind. Yeah, thank you. So you'll see a few more of the topics and I'm going to cover them. So Marsha and I decided to focus on health effects and the brain. We thought those are really key topics to the work that you're doing out there. We thought we'd give you a taste of the curriculum and go over some of the slides. That way you feel equipped in terms of the information, but you can also get a better sense of how you might use this in your setting. So right here with the handbook, just a few other topics. And if you look through the actual download, you'll see how you can use some of these questions depending on particular topic of interest, whether that's health effects, cost, your brain, or marketing, or messaging. So here are some of the Healthy Futures informational slides. What you're seeing right here is just a snapshot of all the slides, which I'm not going to go over in detail, but I thought I'd show you them real quick and we'll focus on a few. That way in this session, you can get just some updates on the health effects of using e-cigarettes or pod vapes. So if you're on the chat right now, I thought this would be really cool, uh, be a really cool time to just check in with some of you uh, by asking you this question. So when you talk to young people, what are some of the long-term health effects of vaping that you mentioned? Or what are some of your talking points that you mentioned when you're talking about the long-term health effects? So I'll give you a moment if you have your ch chat open to just type in any talking points that you offer young people when you're going over the health effects of vaping. And if you don't know, that's fine. I'll, I'll go over a few in a minute or two.
So feel free to type in any responses or any talking points you have for when you're thinking about the long-term health effects of vaping. Just to revisit what Marsha was talking about earlier with Evali, we do know that there have been some sickness and uh, young people have been hospitalized from using these devices. The problem with using e-cigarettes is that they've only been on the market for about 12 years, so we don't know everything about it. So I like this question in some ways because it's kind of like a trick question, right? We don't know everything about the long-term health effects, but we do know enough to inform young people so they can make a wise decision about um, using these devices. So if, if we're thinking about some of the health effects, I'm gonna cover that in the slides. We're gonna focus primarily on the heart and lungs. And I'm hoping that you can walk away with some information on how to talk about this with young people. And just the shapes you saw before, I just wanna let you know, those are linked up with the Healthy Futures Handbook. So the reason why you're seeing that is um, young people would be able to fill out their Healthy Futures Handbook um, while they're, doing, they're seeing these slides. So that's one way you can use the slides and the handbook at the same time. Okay, so I'm gonna just provide a quick overview of what the aerosol and nicotine does to someone's body. So I'll go over this in more detail in a few slides, but what nicotine mainly does is rewires and turns your brain against you. So once your body thinks nicotine is important for survival, that's when you're stepping into the addiction space. Nicotine in particular, these newer pod e-cigarettes, so that includes Joel and Puff Bar, contain something called salt-based nicotine. That type of nicotine is easier for a young person to inhale. The industry designed it that way so that young people can become hooked to nicotine a lot easier. But what that type of nicotine does to the heart is it makes it beat a lot faster. And that could put some stress on the heart. It hasn't been studied in detail, but we do know that it can put someone in this fight or flight mode. The aerosol in the actual, um, that which is released from the e-cigarette or pod vape, you'll sometimes hear the word vapor, which is, doesn't perfectly describe what's coming out of it. It's actually a mixture of chemicals known as an aerosol. So if you're familiar with some of the messaging that goes on with anti-vaping, the aerosol part is really important and we know that it can damage vessels in your circulatory system, which I'll explore with all of you pretty soon. There's another slide on it. The aerosol though, is not only having effects on your circulatory system and your heart, but also is doing damage to your lungs. So that's something I'll talk about in more detail um, coming up. But right now it's just an overview of all the health effects. We also know that the nicotine can increase your acid reflex in your gastrointestinal track. So right here's just a picture of your stomach. We know that it's changing the chemistry there. And this is something that we need to share with young people. So on the previous slide, we saw all of the organs and parts of the body that are being affected by the aerosol and nicotine. So let's talk broadly about the aerosol, but how it affects the lungs in particular. So what you're going to see are a few images of what the aerosol is known to do to the lungs. In the lungs, we have our airways and inflammation and irritation can appear or happen as a result of breathing in this cocktail of chemicals, also known as the aerosol. Another thing we know is that the, there can be a destruction of the air sacs in the lungs. So a lot of what you're seeing shouldn't surprise you. It's not too different from what we know about the long-term health effects of smoking. Um, they've been studying e-cigarettes a little more, and this is what they're finding out so far. Another point that was mentioned in the video that we watched on your risk for COVID-19 is the lowering of your immune system or weakening your immune system by having these aerosol chemicals come into your lungs and interfering with the function of your immune cells in your lungs. So this is a really important point to stress right now, especially during the pandemic. You want young people, you wanna encourage them to go smoke or bait free so they can um, have their lungs ready to fight if they are exposed to this virus. 
Now, looking at some of the studies that have looked at the heart, this is what we currently know about how the aerosol affects um, someone's heart. So I mentioned some of these points earlier, but the aerosol can impair blood vessel function. It can also cause a stiffening of the blood vessels, which will decrease your blood flow throughout your body. This is concerning because a lot of these um, characteristics, like also risk for blood clotting, are associated with your risk for cardiovascular disease over the years. So this is what the aerosol is doing. These, you know, this cocktail of chemicals isn't good for your health. It's not helping you. If you're a young person and um, you're playing sports or you're just trying to stay as healthy as possible, this is not, these chemicals are not helping you in that way. Now, something that I mentioned before was the salt-based nicotine. This slide really looks at how the salt-based nicotine is changing the game in terms of delivering more nicotine. So what we know about a pack of cigarettes is that when we look at the science of nicotine, for each cigarette a, that a person uses, they're actually delivering about one milligram of nicotine. So one milligram of nicotine equals one cigarette. That's what I want you um, to just keep in mind right now as we walk through this slide. So uh, once again, 20 cigarettes, that'd be 20 milligrams of nicotine. So 20 milligrams of nicotine is 20 cigarettes. These newer devices, such as a Joel Pod, what you'll notice is that they're packed with a lot more nicotine and all that nicotine in that pod has a potential of delivering 40 mil or 41.3 milligrams of nicotine, which in terms of cigarettes, if you want to talk cigarettes, that is looking more like 41 cigarettes. So what you're seeing right here is just a representation of the potential for addiction with these newer devices. You're probably wondering why is it so easier to deliver more nicotine um, with these devices? Well, the salt-based nicotine formula, what it does is it really reduces the harshness of the throat hit. So a young person who may be nicotine naive will be breathing in this aerosol. And if that nicotine is salt-based, it's not gonna scratch their throat as much and turn them off from wanting to use this. Some of the other devices we're looking at right here, such as the puff bar, contains more nicotine. The way they're able to load in more nicotine is by having a bigger pod or a bigger volume. That's why there is more nicotine associated with these devices. And lastly, the Soren pod, which has up to 90 milligrams of nicotine. Remember, one milligram of nicotine, one cigarette, right? So that's 90 cigarettes of nicotine that someone can be delivering by using some of these small pods which when looking at, you know, compared to a pack of cigarettes in size, you may think, oh, it's just a small pod, doesn't seem, doesn't seem too harmful. I can't have that much nicotine, but the industry has really worked to create these discrete devices, which are just packed with nicotine and can really get a young person addicted pretty quickly. If you're going over this with a group of young people who are, have used just the main takeaway, it contains a lot of nicotine. <laughs> okay, so like before, I showed you a few, just an overview or a snapshot of the slides we have in this part of the curriculum. This one is called Your Brain. So what I wanna do with you, all of you real quick is, once again, if in the chat, just type in what you think it means to be addicted. So this is just like we're going through the curriculum as if you're the students you can include a student response or you can include something, maybe some talking points that you usually include when you're talking to a young person about this. So just give yourself a moment, read over this. And if you have a comment about what it means to be addicted, please include that in the chat.
So if you still want to put something in the chat, go ahead. I'm going to just share just some talking points about addiction or just some thoughts around it. So when we talk about addiction science, sometimes people ask me, hey, Richard, is it mainly based on genetics? Is it based on their environment? And what they have found out is it's a little bit of both, right? When we're talking about someone's risk for addiction, if you come from a family where there are reported cases of a lot of your family members being addicted, the chances are if you come across a drug or substance, you're probably, you could become addicted. Um, and that's something to be mindful of. But if you're also living in an environment where you're ex being exposed to a lot of this marketing and messaging, that could also increase your chances of using and becoming addicted or dependent. Uh, so that's something just to keep in mind when you're talking about addiction. But you have to also remember if you're a young person and your brain is finishing up some of it key, its key parts of brain development, you also don't want to be adding drugs to the equation because what that will do is hijack your brain a lot easier than an adult brain. So I'm going to go over some slides I'm covering that material. Once again, the shape just corresponds to the Healthy Futures Handbook. Now, this slide right here is just covering some main points about how drugs can affect the brain. Now, when you talk to a young person about the payoff for using drugs, over time, it's not a great payoff because what your brain does is pretty smart is whenever you stimulate the reward pathway, so that's a part of your brain that produces a chemical called dopamine. Some of us are, may already be familiar with it, but that's the pleasure chemical. And what that does to someone's brain is um, like a drug, if they're stimulating that part of the brain, it tells their brain like, oh, this is good. I like this. It makes me feel good. The only problem is this is an artificial stimulation. Over time, the brain will outsmart that drug. And what it'll basically do is respond less to that chemical. So for a young person, the payoff may seem amazing at the beginning, like, oh, wow, I feel really good by using this. But over time, the brain will not want to respond to it. And a young person will probably use more to feel, try to feel more of the response, but that's when you step into addiction. At that point, um, if someone's using a lot to try to fill the drug, their brain is probably uh, just desensitized and they're probably feeling withdrawal symptoms, which is why they're using. Now, the way drugs really uh, go through the brain and take advantage of it is by mimicking chemicals we already produce. So we have endogenous or natural um, neurotransmitters and drugs will come in like in this instance with acetylcholine. So if we're talking about nicotine, like with this visual you're seeing, what nicotine will do is it will actually mimic acetylcholine. And what that does is it leads to a chain reaction and which will eventually produce dopamine. So nicotine, which you're seeing right here in the orange will bind to these acetylcholine receptors and the chain reaction will occur. A young person will feel pleasure. Something I want to say when you're talking about this in terms of pleasure is that some young people that you're working with may come from backgrounds where maybe they don't have a strong parental support, maybe they don't have a community, maybe they don't have a good support system. So a lot of the reasons they may be using these drugs and to begin with is they want to feel good. And you have to remind them there's nothing wrong with wanting to feel good. It's really about how they do that. So with drugs, it may seem like an easy way in which it is, and they can really take a shortcut to feeling good. But over time, it's really going to screw over their brain. And what it'll do is it will um, fill it less. And you don't want to have to be addicted to these chemicals and have it take over uh, your habits in your life. So remember, we talked about in the last section, the health effects and how these products are being engineered and designed. And remember, I talked about salt-based nicotine. So that's one feature that allows young people or makes it easier for young people to use these devices or become addicted to nicotine. So with a cigarette, which you're seeing here, there are a few features that we're aware of from our tobacco education uh, that really allow for someone to use a cigarette and become addicted a lot easier. So this slide is just pointing a few of those out for you. So companies, tobacco companies, Big Tobacco will increase the amount of nicotine. They'll use menthol to mask the harshness of that nicotine hit. So 
we know that these flavorings and other components, which is not too different from e-cigarettes. So when you think about e-cigarettes, you are still talking about tobacco here, but this is more like the cigarette 2.0, the, the new uh, cigarette, right? And the reason why I have question marks here on this slide is to indicate that we haven't really studied some of these other parts of the device. So we don't know if they're using bronchodilators, if they're using acetaldehyde um, in their actual, in this product, in a Juul device. And this is something we have to investigate. But the e-cigarette companies had their playbook. They didn't have to reinvent a lot of these features. They just used them again in their product to get young people to use. So the other section we have is on messaging. We won't be going over the actual slides for this, but I just wanted you to see what we're offering here. So in this section, we're really looking at some of the messages that young people encounter, whether that is through print or media, but also on social media and how some of these products are painted um, to be harmless, that they're okay for their health, it can make them feel better when we know that's not the case. So that's what this section really looks at. Another section that we wanted to include is we do know that it's very effective when you um, talk about price with what young people are spending and um, how much you're spending on some of these newer um, pod-based e-cigarettes. So right here is just another section looking at the cost and really looking at it from an angle in terms of what could you be spending, the money that you're spending on tobacco or e-cigarettes, how can you use that money for other parts of your life, um, other things you wanna invest in um, for your future. So that's a, a lot of our angle for this curriculum is really empowering them by asking them these types of questions. The final slides in our curriculum are to support young people in your session or if you're doing a one on one, we have these quick shout outs to these resources. So this is through the truth initiative. This is um, a resource that offers daily quitting tips, something that they can use on their cell phone. And it's an interface that our team's familiar with. It's very easy to use so they can immediately text ditch Joel to this number. And the thing is, this it's pretty cool because they'll follow up with you, check in with you, ask you questions, give you facts, just see how you're doing. So that's one resource. Here's another one. This is uh, teensmokefree.gov. There is a number they can call. And just a reminder for us who are doing this work, you're probably already aware of this, but young people really have to be ready to quit. It starts with them. With this curriculum, we're hoping you can motivate them towards that or at least get a plan set up if they're going to consider it in the future, I'm quitting. So thing is, if a young person is ready, if they, if they wanna write this number down, maybe they won't call it immediately, but they, at least they know it's there. Uh, some of the resources smoke it, uh, focus on smoking and it's great to see ones that are primarily focused on e-cigarettes. So this is a great, another great resource through the California Smokers Helpline and they can call this number. So any resource that's focused on e-cigarettes is great. And if you can provide that or just make it visible to a young person, they know they can reach out to those resources. And here's another one, My Life, My Quit. Some of these are limited to certain states. So just keep that in mind when you're looking through this. Another point that I wanna mention is our teacher talking points are here. So a lot of what I'm saying is already included in the notes section of the slide. And if you're wondering like, oh, Richard, you're saying a lot. How do, how do I capture all that today? It's actually in our teacher talking points. So all those caveats about this being for a particular state or for a particular individual, don't worry, it's all there for you to read over and familiarize yourself with. So after the PowerPoint presentation is done, what you would do with the young person is sort of give them the kind of like a follow up with um, the where are you at? And again, we're going to find out where the, how they feel about 
um, they've said that they heard um, um, the education that was provided to them. And it could be that they may say that I'm not really interested, I might want to cut back, or I might want to quit. So kind of depending on what they say um, will lead you to the next um, discussion with them. Um, have them come up with a goal for themselves for the next 30 days, even if, um, if they're not quite there to quit yet. And then what is it that they uh, need help with? Do they need a friend to help them? Do they need a hotline that um, we just heard about all these different um, hotlines? What is it that they need to accomplish their goals? And similarly to what um, uh, Richard was saying, all of these um, handouts that we have here, um, it also has a, a lot of talking points so that you could also um, be um, comfortable um, when you're doing your sessions with um, your young people. So some of the prompts that you might want to use when you see a, um, when you get your, your sheet back from the student is um, you might see that they um, selected a higher number. So you could ask them what brought that change or, and what do they see as the next steps? And um, basically um, towards the end of the session is I'm really thanking them for attending because you know a lot of times when students are caught vaping on, on campus, um, they're, you know, they're afraid and they, you know, they don't wanna get in trouble and that kind of thing. Um, so it really takes a lot for them to be able to attend this type of session. And, um, and as long as you can provide them with a very safe space and a, and a place that's very, like I said earlier, very empathetic to where they're at, um, they'll be able to share more with you. Um, you could offer, again, as we said earlier, on um, some more free resources that, um, if they if they like it, if they think it would be helpful. Um, and if you're a 2 be person, um, you might want to refer the student to the 2 pay person if they, there's one, or it could be um, uh, another wellness person, uh, staff that you have at your clinic. Um, so kind of like whatever follow-up plans that are that would be helpful for the young person just to have a, like a set of referrals ready for them. And, and um, it's just one point. Um, so making sure you have everything ready before you, um, the student, before you meet with your students so that they have all those resources available to them. Uh, so we have on uh, social media, uh, so we have Facebook and we have Twitter. So feel free to follow us and um, tag, tag us in any pictures you post. Um, love to hear from you. And that's also a way to kind of get updates as far as um, either curriculum or other events that we do. So we did a bunch of um, parent webinars and educator webinars over the summer. So that's a way to um, get informed. And that's um, our contact information. If you have any questions or if you'd like additional information, we'd be happy to help you with that. Marsha, we currently have a few Q&A questions. So sure. I'm not sure if you want to do the eval first or if you want to address some of those questions before that. Well, let's do the questions. OK, so the first question, I'm just going from bottom to top. So. Have you heard of an increase of vape use since the COVID pandemic? Maybe you already answered this. Well, I can say that, oh, go ahead, Russia. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead, Richard. Well, one point that I have heard about is young people using more cigarettes during this time. That's something that we've been hearing about. We haven't looked at, so, the problem is doing the surveys, like Marsha was talking about earlier, we're probably gonna find out um, how much usage is actually taking place. So that will be a good place, a good resource for looking at that data. Uh, Marsha, I don't know if you, what you wanted to say for this question. Well, there was something that I read and actually I have it right here about um, the complications associated with um, vaping and COVID um, that the US general, uh, general the U.S. Surgeon General had responded and said that um, they speculated that part of the that vaping might be the reason 
why the, U the U.S. has seen higher percentages of young people diagnosed with COVID-19 in other countries. And that was something that he reported in March. Um, it was televised. Um, so it just kind of like speaks to the, um, the need for us to really inform our young people about the, the harms associated with vaping, especially now during COVID. So thank you for that question. Well, that's a great question. The next question mm -hmm. is, what can we do when we encounter school administrative staff that are more interested in punishing students for bringing vaping products on campus rather than creating a learning opportunity? Also, can the four hour session be divided into multiple lessons? You could definitely divide the four hour session into multiple sessions and the same with the two hours. So kind of like um, based on how your needs and how you would work it at, um, at your school. Um, I, what I would say to the administrators about um, punishing students is that we already know that punishment doesn't work. It's not effective. And uh, what we want to do is that, I mean, if you think about the whole youth development movement and how we're, we are developing young people, and so what better way to do that by providing them with the tools that they need so that they um, can quit vaping so that they can be um, healthier adults. Um, even with um, the youth of the, the youth action board that we work with, they're they're totally against um, any form of punishment, they, and they they want their peers to learn about ways to um, take care of their health, but also that they're not they're not informed about really what the harms are in these vape products. I mean, and we're talking about products that have been around not too long, and we don't know like what Richard was saying about the harm, like all the harms yet, um, but. The data that is out there, we know that it is harmful, but we also know that a lot of youth are still do not know too much about them. Yeah, and I've noticed that talking about e-cigarettes and the harms associated with using them is a great opportunity, like Marcia's saying, to talk about student wellness and, and just being a young person and what it means to be healthy. So I think if you can pitch it that way, it's just a better reason to have these learning opportunities, use this curriculum um, for students who are caught. So it's really a, a chance for them to feel empowered about the information they're hearing and just think more deeply about maybe why they're using uh, these products. Okay, Marsha, I have one more question for us. How do we help students quit? Most students that I talk to admit that vaping is the only way that they can cope with stress slash anxiety. The closest that I've gotten a student to quitting is they promise to lower the nicotine amount. So I would want to know from the student what are the what are some what are some alternatives that they can um, do for coping with stress. Um, so that was something that um, our youth action board worked on over the summer, um, talking about being. You know, under shelter in place and having these stressors of what are young people doing in terms of um, quitting or not. And sort of like, well, what what is the replacement for that person if they're not gonna be using nicotine anymore? And and kind of working with them as far as like, well, what, what, are, some things, um, what are some things that you could do in place of it? So can they do meditation? Can they do, can they knit? Um, can they go for um, a bike ride or a walk? So kind of depending on the student and what it is that they're interested in it. And the way to find that out is just, you know, continue to have those conversations with them in terms of like, what are some like, uh, like other alternatives, other healthy alternatives that they can um, come up with. And to add to what Marsha is saying for some talking points around this topic, it's really about empowering young people to learn how to activate, you know, their, uh, dopaminergic center of their brain right like it's like what make produces dopamine for me and a lot of the times they may not know all of that because their brain is figuring that out and that's a good thing like they are at a stage of development where they're trying to figure out what fires dopamine for me naturally and if you can help them in that process identify what helps them fire that dopamine whether it's listening to music going for a walk with their friends are doing any of those activities, then it's more power to them. They know, okay, instead of using this product, which is a lot of the messaging we get in this country, like use this to feel better, use that to feel better. If you can change the conversation and get young people to think, oh, I'm not feeling well, maybe I should do A, B, or C. 
then that really puts the the power of the ball in their court. And that's what we want to do with this curriculum as well. I just want to uh, just uh, add on to what Richard is saying. Um, there was an activity that I did in a kind of in a classroom setting where it was just doing that. It was just asking them, well, what fires up your dopamine and just going around in the classroom? Um, and you could do the same thing like in a in a one-to-one -one or in a group setting. So well, it fires up your dopamine. That youth are very interested in their brains and how they how the brain functions. And um, I think um, that's a, a, definitely a way for at least to start that conversation with them as far as like what what what, what what's a good replacement for you in terms of um, nicotine use and things like that. So thank you. Yeah. And I know just back to mention one thing about in that comment about lowering nicotine, the nicotine content, we know these pod vapes do contain a lot of nicotine. So if that's part of their plan to eventually get off nicotine by lowering their amount, that's something you can support them with and come up with a plan where eventually they don't have to be dependent on that nicotine. We have some more questions coming in on the Q&A, so let me read those real quick. So here's one question. Since we not, uh, might not be catching students vaping right now due to distance um, learning, what are some suggestions for supporting students? I have to say that um, just even from the youth that um, are part of the Youth Action Board, they, they are incredibly overwhelmed with school right now. If there is a way that through the, um, kind of like the, the online platforms that they're on right now with you all, if there's a way that you could dedicate a time where you could check in with them and just see how they're doing. Um, if there's a way to integrate, uh, kind of like what we did today, this morning, some of you went to the uh, Wellness um, Wednesday activity that we had today where we did meditation and exercise. If there's a way that your, um, your school can do something like that where they could have a few moments where they can um, either share or, or meditate or, or do something because our, our, our young people are incredibly stressed right now. And uh, a lot of the, from what they're telling me that they're, the workload is, is um, incredibly intense for them. So um, I, would, I would really encourage everyone to try to integrate some time with them and get to do some kind of checking with them and see how they're doing and take it from there. I think that's a great response, Marsha. We want our young people to feel supported. And I know as adults, we're like struggling to cope with everything going on right now. So we have to be there for them and just remind them like, hey, we're here to listen. We're here to, to see how you're doing and empower you in any way we can. Another question we received that just came in is, do students admit right away that they are vaping? Or do students admit it rapidly that they are vaping? I think it depends on the person that they're talking with. Um, you kind of have to set the stage for them to be able to feel comfortable sharing. Um, the whole, you know, the in, especially like in a clinical setting, the confidential setting, and um, just making them feel um, welcome that you're not in trouble. Um, let's have a conversation, and I mean, depending on. And also, you know, depending on how much the student feels comfortable sharing, um, they will. But if they, if you're approaching it from a point of like you're in trouble, you're a bad person, um, and I'm not saying that that's what what you all are doing, but if, if they feel that, it's going to be really difficult for them to be um, forthcoming with them with their use. Thank you, Marsha. So that's all we have for the Q and A's. If you have any questions, we have a little bit of time left, but we also have our training email. So um, if you have your cell phone in front of you, or if you have your computer, you can type in the link. I know the conference is also doing or offering an email, but we wanted to get this feedback just to see how we did today on this training or presentation of the Healthy Futures curriculum.
looks like there, there aren't any other questions. So um, as Richard mentioned, there's the link for, or you can scan the QR code for their evaluation and also um, for the conference evaluation and the today, you should be receiving a link for that as well. Um, and the recording will be available next week. Also the slides, hopefully you were able to catch some of those links I put in there for a lot of those great, great resources um, that they shared. And um, did you share your, e I, oh yeah, you did in the previous slide, you shared your email addresses. Mm -hmm. um, any other final words before we wrap up? Looks like we're all done. Okay, well, thank you so much. Hopefully you can join us um, for our next um, session that we have in honoring paying tribute to Dr. Barbara Staggers, who's a champion for school health. That should go live right at 1.30. So um, once it's 1.30, you should be able to see that at the top of your agenda. Um, if not, sometimes it's weird trying to navigate. You might have to go to the filter function to find it. And then we still have another great day tomorrow, but thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Marsha and Richard so much for um, sharing such valuable information. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody.